Hi folks. I think the broadband is actually working for a change. I think they've sorted out what the problem was. Just miking up. Hope everyone's good. Had a good Christmas and New Year. Oh, right. All right, we got my tea. All ready to rock. I just check my levels. I think looking good. Hopefully the stream will stay up. That'd be really rather marvellous if it does, given my recent experience. I don't know what they did. There was nothing this end that was changed. Um, but something happened after uh, a number of um, tests complaints etc etc it seems to be more constant now the access that we're getting so I have no idea what was causing the problem but I mean we haven't changed anything in our end of the broadband so I'm guessing it's you know something either in down the street or at their end <sighs> So, from the lockdown UK, my hair is super long already. God knows how long it's going to be by the time we get out of this damn lockdown. Um, let's see if we can cover any news and things. Uh, I did make some notes. Let me just see if I can pull some of those up. Hope everyone had a great time over the holidays. Mm -hmm. right, let me just put this up. I need to turn on. Um, what do I turn? That one I need. Um, so my intention today is to talk, just I'll cover some news items, community stuff, and then um, then I'm going to talk about uh, tiles because I've made a change on the tiles, uh, the tiles out. So I need to make some changes on that. So I might do a bit of bit of cab, but talk around that as well. Um, there's probably some other bits and pieces because I've been doing quite a bit of work over the holiday period, planning on which bits I'm going to make first and um, how the pieces fit together. But uh, I'm also changing the motor driver chips as well. I found some other motor drivers, um, which is interesting. I went back through some of the projects I've worked on over the last few years because there was I remembered using something on a project um, probably about four years ago commercial project and I remembered these chips that I used um, which are great little chips for small motors so I might mention those and go through that as well so let's do the uh, news items hold on so let's just bring this up
So itemize here. Oh, hold on, let me just run this. Get rid of these messages. Um, so this was interesting. I got this on Twitter. I don't know if anyone follows Luke Wren. Um, let me give you a link to his username. He did something I wasn't aware that you could actually do on this chip. Uh, here's his uh, Twitter. Um, but in particular, what is interesting is uh, you can see this on his Twitter. He's actually driving DVI directly from the ICE 45K, which is really interesting. He does, um, he's been working on like uh, a Game Boy type thing based around RISC-V. And he's been using, I think, the ECP-5 and the uh, ICE 40 up 5k you may know him Laurie I don't know or you may be aware of his work but what's interesting here and let me just get this up so that we can um, hopefully you can see this because uh, I didn't realize actually that it was possible to do this on the ice fork too I didn't think the outputs were fast enough to be able to render this so have you seen this before, Laurie? Let me just bring it up so that we can see it in case you're not. Um... Uh... Okay, don't show me then, machine. Here we go. So he's running his stuff here on a uh, up 5k, and he's deri he's driving the DVI HDMI directly, which surprised me. I, from the information I'd been given, I didn't realise it was actually possible to do that because I thought the outputs on the um, up 5k were somewhat limited well not just the outputs but the the io and driving the io but it looks good you know it looks clean have you heard of uh risk boy and you know the project or uh, luke wren sorry if you, even if you haven't seen this, it's quite interesting. He seems like a very smart chap. But there, look, you can see in the image, he's actually running the um, uh, icebreaker. You can see it down at the bottom there. Hold on, I'll try and freeze it there. You can see the icebreaker here. And then that all the all looks on that DVI board, as far as I can tell, is uh, I think it's got a bunch of um, DC blocking caps, and then the DVI connector, HDMI connector, which is amazing. Um, let me just see if I can find. Just do a search on this. See if I can. I don't know if he's got it on um, GitHub. There we go.
Rispoy is an open source portable games console designed from scratch. This includes a RISC V compatible CPU, a raster graphics pipeline and display controller, other chip infrastructure, bus fabric, memory controller, UART, GPIO, etc., and a PCB layout all in KiCad. You can see the diagram here block diagram. It's quite an interesting project, really. I think it's mostly Verilog, by the way. Let me just check, actually. It does different versions for different amounts of memory, obviously. It's all in Verilog by the looks of it. Definitely worth a look in though. And I'm not sure why, uh, how I know Luke Rem I definitely follow him on Twitter, but I can't put a face to the name. Um, so he may have done other stuff before but it didn't spring to mind. But this is really interesting. So he's done an ECP5 version and he's done this ICE40 version. I think he was going to look at maybe doing a, um, a Xilinx version as well. So he talks about Arduino is one of the boards he got it working on. Um, what does he have, in fact? And those are ECP5 specific files. There's a HX8 version here. Uh, I'm not sure what he used for the HX8. He might have used the lattice board. I wonder if there's any clues in here. Mm, PLLs. Yeah, it's the evaluation board, I think, that he's done this. So it might, um, you could probably port it to Black Ice. But how are you doing the memory on the HX8? Hold on. It's DRAM. That's RAM address minus one. So where's he getting that from? Where's he importing that from? Hold on. Local param. So he's setting that to 18. In this file, it's 18 bit. Uh, I think that's probably, yeah, 2 to the 18. 262. 262. Hmm. Oh, wait a minute, SRAM, SRAM. What is he using for the memory here? I'm a bit confused now. Hold on. C W E L A 
is from this DQ. Ah, oh, maybe, maybe he's using an external RAM chip. That's what he's doing. Hold on. It will probably uh, run on the old black ice that had the SRAM or the original Maestro. Um, wait a minute, it might have said on the main page. I've kind of jumped the gun here. As I'm uh, intended to fit on the ICE 40 HXK FPGA 4 LUT. And it was using it's using oh, he said it? it's moved on to greater things he says it he probably means um East P five. Hold on. Ah, he's got his own board that he did it on originally. Wow, I didn't realize. So he's added uh, some SRAM on the board. So he's used the HXK and an SRAM chip. Interesting. So that must be severely penalized then when it works on the um, up 5K. Do, 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 do. What does he say here? It's about making it right. This build replaces the external 512 kilobit with 16 bit wide SRAM of the Rispoy development hardware with an internal 256 kilobyte 32 bit wide synchronous memory. And he uses Trellis to build it for the ECP5. So, what does he say about the um, up 5K then? Oh, it's a ball file. That's for the 85F version. Yeah, okay. So how does he get it to fit into the other one? Or maybe he just, maybe the whole thing doesn't run on the um, up 5K. Maybe it's just like a technology demonstration. On small FPGAs like the ICE 40 up 5K wrist boy may be configured to use smaller RV32i variant of the processor rather than the higher performance RV32IMC. But what about the memory? It doesn't seem to say anything about that. But you've got nowhere near enough memory on that. You've got like half of that, haven't you? Was it 124k or something? K points. Maybe I'm missing something. Um, mind you, if I go back in here, is it in the core? No. Uh, icebreaker. So what does he use here? He's using the same. How is he doing that then? Is he using HyperRAM or something? 18 bits. How can he do that? Oh look, but in here Oh look, he's overriding it. Two to the fifteen, hundred and twenty-eight 
kilobytes. I guess it maybe it just runs runs it half size or something. I don't know. Interesting. Anyhow, it looked cool to me and it was interesting what he was doing. Um, sorry, let me just catch up with what Laurie's been saying here. This is a similar project in sign nice. Just have a look at what um, what Laurie's pointing me to. So Silice Playground. I mentioned Silice before. A couple of things. Pause a Risk Five RVIMC CPU. Okay, so it's a Risk Five CPU written in Silice. Interesting. Oh, they talk about HDMI, but they don't talk about let's support. So they talk about J one fourth. Um, it's bright. So yeah, he's got a sprite support and all of that as well, which is kind of cool. Asteroids, cool. ULX3S. Trinkles, what you doing? Cool. Uh, so, what else is Laurie saying? My latest project is a is a Sega Master System. Wow. Cool. Do you want to go out? Hold on. Let me let the cat through. Sega Master System. Crikey. That's going back a bit. Isn't that like um, Echo the Dolphin and all that sort of stuff? Was it Echo the Dolphin? What was the requirement for the Sega Master System, memory-wise? Sorry, how much memory did it require? Yeah, and Sonic. Good old Sonic. Five twelve kilobyte. Well, wow, that's more than I. Remember it being actually five twelve. Using the SD RAM. Bank switches. What well, with bank switches you mean? So you normally get like a two bit bank switch which takes you up to eight megabyte. What does the ULX 3S have on it? How much SD RAM does it have? So it's running at, uh, what frequency is it running at? Bank switches. Are you talking about DRAM banks or are you talking about the way that it was architected internally to get over its memory limitations? You mean the it was 64 banked? Oh, usually 32. Yeah, okay. Three point five megahertz. Oh yeah, so it's probably easy from the SD RAM point of view. Then you can deal with the um, the memory freshes and stuff. You've got plenty of time then, haven't you? Don't 
So how were the bank switches done? Were they done via a, an additional register or something? Are you using one of the Z80 ones? So much dust on this desk. <sighs> Gonna need to give it a brush. The ROMs have memory mappers that switch 16K banks. Mm. I'm still a bit shocked that you can do um, direct HDMI on the uh, iSpotty. I really didn't realise that you could do that. I'm quite surprised. That's an additional feature. What 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 would be the best chip for um, a uh, retro board? Do you think would it be the ECB five? In your opinion. power isn't an issue is it for retro type things so um the 12 right let me remind myself here sorry i've forgotten how much memory we get with these um let me just remember and look up. Oh, come on, I hate this menu. Lattice's site is frustrating. So, yes, remind myself. So, um, in terms of memory, it was. So, um, officially for the 12K, it was. 97 no what am i talking about five seven six no seven six uh 72 k bits but the 12 is really a uh, 25 isn't it Thinking about it, so it's actually one zero zero eight one zero zero eight one zero eight hundred and twenty six K on the twelve slash twenty five. But is that enough to run most of the retro things? Which 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 ones? need more than that i guess it's down to the screen size isn't it more than anything but i guess properly for the retro you need either the 45 or 85 that goes up to what is it one nine four four one nine four four five eight that's about 240k Or is there not really much benefit? I mean, if you go from the 12K to the 45K, given that you've got 25K, man, you've got 126 or whatever, going to 240, does that make much difference? Or the jump, does it just mean that you need something external like SD RAM? In most of those cases, and you're not really getting much benefit out of the um, forty using the forty-five F rather than the twelve slash twenty-five. Large ROMs. Uh, 
and those ROMs get loaded into the RAM or ST RAM. Did you tell me how much was on the ULX3 ST RAM wise? Thirty two megabytes. Okay. Is that megabytes or megabits? Megabytes. So it's hundred and twenty eight megabit. That would be does that need three banks or is it four banks? Four thirty twos. Okay. Um the other thing, Laurie, did you, I'm sure you or someone else said it's um, it's easier to use SD RAM than uh, DDR RAM. Because on the ECP5 that I'm currently designing, I've got um, DDR2. RAM and I've got it uh, on the 12F. I was going to put um, 32 megabytes, and then on the 45, I was going to put 64 megabytes. But does the does you does the fact that that's not SD RAM, but it's DDR2. Does that cause problems? I mean, I know it takes more pins and we've got to get the Verilog done for it, which is going to be fun, but. Retro needs consistent latency to support, to simulate SRAM. Yeah, I'm still not sure how I'm going to do it. My guess, I was probably going to take a look at what was there on Litex to start with and work from that. No, there isn't one that I've seen, but I was going to start from the Litex stuff. I'm not exactly looking forward to that bit, to be quite honest. I'm looking to find some help from some more knowledgeable folk. Oh, there was something else I should add to my list that I forgot today. I wonder if I've still got that open. Uh, let me just add that to my list whilst I remember. Uh, what's it called? Oh, yeah. Mr. Board uses SD RAM extension as DDR3 is not usable. Interesting. So what what you seem to be indicating to me is Oh, wait a minute. Th this is because they use the um I forgot what it's called now. It's a combination of ARM and FPGA, isn't it? Um Crikey, I should remember what this is called. And yes, the memory controller is interleaved and one memory access can bugger up the other memory access apparently. I remember reading about this. Because other people have complained about it. Not, not for retro stuff, but generally. It's got a single memory controller and the way that it's muxed is not 
not conducive to consistent access. Yeah, so we wouldn't have the same issue when you're running in metro mode. We can guarantee that nothing else is accessing it. We can give it sole access. I mean, you, you don't exactly use a bus in most retro systems. Not, not a bus as in, you know, an axi or anything like that. It tends to be more direct, doesn't it? I mean, any of the memory stuff's tricky. The higher you go up, the more tricky it comes. Which remind me, I've got it on my list here, so we could do this now. What about hyper RAM? Have you used any of the hyper RAM stuff? Because um, I'm trying to find the links earlier. I've just this actually came out a little while back, and I, for some reason I can't remember exactly why. Here, look. So Winbond have got some um, hyper RAM stuff now. So this example here is a 64 megabit. That's eight megabytes. Uh, I don't know if that'd be big enough. Um, they do do a bigger one. They do 128 megabit as well. Um, this is a 200 megahertz. And that's DDR. So let me just open this. Sorry. So this is quite an interesting um, one because before you had the Cypress ones, but I didn't realise until recently that uh, Wimbond they do a. Uh, I think it's 128 megabit, a 64 megabit, and a 32 megabit. That's kind of four, eight, and sixteen. Is it? Um, again, it's like you only need 12 pins to drive it, which is kind of cool. Um, does it talk about the rates here? Wrapped burst length. Because this looked very interesting. So you can see the interface is really simple here. Uh, and there are drivers out there. I think TNT did one. Right. Sylvan did one for the Ice 40. Uh, although I don't know what clock rate he was using for all that. So you normally have a differential clock, you have a CS chip, chip select, you have a read white type signal, then you have an 8 bit bus. Um, and I think I think that's DDR that's on both edges of the clock and a reset pin. It's that simple. But timing is really the critical bit here. I remember Richard looking at using um, HyperRAM and having big issues. Now I think he was trying to use it on the Black Ice. Not necessarily the MX. It might have been Black Ice Two. I think. I don't know what the latencies are on the hyper RAM. Let's I wonder if we can see that in here. Does it give us this? I've never used any hyper RAM, so uh I mean, you don't have to deal with refreshing, obviously. Don't automatically. So maximum clock rate is 200 megahertz, it says here. Double data rate, yeah, so as I said, so up to 400. Um, was that meta transactions per second? Is that what I mean by MTS? Single ended or differential clock. Um, 
it's got the data strobe, read and write data strobe, but does it show power saving linear bursts? Uh, how's the burst? One wrap burst followed by a linear burst. A 64 megabit only. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I think you have to run it at 3 volt 3 for the higher frequency. But maybe not. This doesn't seem to suggest that. That's saying 200 megahertz at 3 volt and 200 megahertz at 1.8 volt. I thought that it was kind of one or other. Or maybe that's the Cypress thing. Um, right, hold on. So we're looking at the index here. Does it say. You have to bear with me here, guys, because I've not looked at, at any of these before. Um, ball assignments, functional description, transaction, read transactions, right, right, right transactions without initial latency. I'm just trying to think what happened because, hold on, look at that diagram because you've got no weight pin here. Are you waiting for the RWDS to change? Is that, it seems to be bi-directional signal. Hold on. I'm catching up here, guys. Um, Hyperbus transaction details, let's have a look. So, uh, command address bit of silence. <laughs> yeah, really all right. A bus transaction is started with CS going low. We're clocking idle state. The first three clock cycles transfer three words of the command address. Information design the transaction characteristics. The command address words are presented with DDR timing using the first six clock edges. Following characteristics are defined by the command address information. Either right, the space, memory space, or ready space, whether a transaction will be linear or wrapped burst sequence. Target mode right now. Change to right. Uh, so the read write data strobe here. Is this a read or write? Hold on. So maybe that's. Uh, read write. I don't find the transaction. So is that driven by the chip during a read? Figure one shows a portion of the read transaction on the Hyperus clock or differential clock showed the dash line waveform. Data is edge aligned with the read write data strobe serving as a read data strobe during the read transactions. So that's, that's being asserted by the um, Hyperbus, Hyperbus chip, presumably. Uh, data is always transferred in full word increments, word granularity transfers. Word address increments for each clock cycle, byte A, is between read, write, TS, rising and falling edges, and followed by B bytes. Data bits in each byte are always in high to low. So these are bursts. So you're talking about a single byte lorry rather than a burst. Yeah, that's probably a bit more complicated. It, it wins on the burst. I don't know what happens on a single. Hold on. This isn't headed very clearly. Retransactions.
there are boundaries Um, what do they call them here? Memory, er crossing memory array boundaries. You can have latencies. So it may be that part of the memory can be accessed more quickly. It's within the same thing, i.e. you wouldn't maybe need to set up, you set up a register for the boundary and then access to that is quick. But if you go outside of that section, then maybe you have to reset that register first or there's an additional latency or something. We might have an initial access to that data. Yeah, I'm not sure if it will work for retro or not. Definitely worth looking into. I mean, if it's possible, and as you say, yes, I mean, it will also depend on how fast the FPGA itself can talk to it, i.e. the clock rate at which it can operate. I'm not sure what the maximum is on that. Um, I can't remember what TNT's GitHub is. Can you, Laurie? You might have an example there, although it would be with the Cypress one. Yeah, it's quite complicated here to work out how you're accessing different bits. Each row of 64 half pages, each page has 8 words, each column has 512k words, 1k bytes. Something worth looking into. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes, smile not. I'd be intrigued to see what he says. Uh, play room with it. Collection of IP cores modules. I don't know. <sighs> cores. Mcash. QSPI. SPI. SPI. Video. Oh, hyperama right at the top. Let's take past it. Hi, O Post. Welcome. We're just looking at some hyperam stuff at the moment. We're trying to work out whether it'd be possible to use it for retro applications. So, what does he say? Uh, Mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. Oh. Um. Right, um, H, H RAM D nine physical I forty H RAM top. So we'll look at top first. Right, what does it say here? TS4. Uh, mm.
Signals. We straight in. Not a lot of commenting in his Verilog here. Shit. Attributes. Hmm. Hold on. <laughs> I post says great sign of power no comments <laughs> yeah I mean don't get me wrong Sylvan knows exactly what he's doing you know and he's not just connecting these up in a normal IO well he's using everything on the edge of the IO all the functionality that's this he's setting up these surdies groups and all sorts of stuff it's super smart he really squeezes maximum performance out of this but i was just looking for something that indicated um uh rates and stuff but there's no like comments that talk about bus speeds Clock 92 times. That's 90 degree separation, presumably. Two phase clock. Hmm. Nothing clear, I'm afraid. Nothing obvious. Why is he saying TS equals 4 and SW equals 4? Generate delays. It's going to be tricky to work out. Damn. I was hoping I could have a peek in here to get a look. Oh. Some indication of performance, but there's nothing here. It's not. Unless it's done at a higher level. There's nothing else in there, is there? Sim. Dot. Ah, here we go. Control registers. Oh, this is pretty good documentation, but it doesn't give me any estimations or anything there. It's just how the registers are used. <sighs> I'm interested in know what performance he gets. I don't have any idea. If what speed he's running, there's no clues in there. What's that? No, no clues. Hmm. I suppose this would give us anything. No. No, 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 no. Okay. implementation but unfortunately not um, video oh look he's talking about HDMI here mm, that's interesting sorry we're going off piece slightly oh, maybe this is I wonder if this was what was used to do the video output, HDMI, PH, right? Or is this to support um, Peter's HDMI plugin? Using four times surdays to push four pixels at a time at once. 
so it can run quarter of the pixel clock. HDMI PHY using four times thirties. H sync V sync D clock HDMI data. A bit from fabric. Data width minus four. There's the colors. I really need to look more deeply into this. This is really interesting what he's doing here. But it's also It's running at a fourth of the clock rate. Hmm. Very interesting. Right, so I'm, I'm going off at a tangent. Sorry, folks. Gone down a rabbit hole here. Yeah. So, um, it's up a fair amount of pins though. Which, which one are you talking about? HDMI or the HyperRAM? I post. The point of using the HyperRAM is you know, if, if, I mean, you don't have any choice. If you're on something like uh, the ICE 40 up 5K, that you can't connect anything other than, you know, either QSPI, SPI flash, or HyperRAM, because there's just not enough pins. Um, but also on, on larger FPGAs, you know, if you add a DDR chip, you, immediately that's 45 pins, you know. If it's an SD RAM, depending on the size, it's going to take, you know, anywhere between 36 and 40 pins. So it takes a fair chunk of your I.O. Um, hence the talk about the Hyper RAM as a possible solution. something that I haven't yet explored but the question in this particular case was would it be possible to use HyperRAM for a retro or for retro applications or the latency is going to be too great um, so you're talking about HDMI, yeah. Well, HDMI you need, to drive a HDMI natively, you need clock and free color outputs, all of which are pairs, differentials. So you need eight, eight IOs, which are differential capable. Or, yeah, I mean, actually, you should really use a chip in between because the, they use a current drive differential normally, but you can get away with driving them through caps effectively. I post is saying uh, HyperM seems like it's fast. You could allow the hyper RAM option of requesting clock stretch. The soft core allows it. Yeah, the issue with retro is most retro stuff is written to directly access a memory location and get a um, get the data from that memory cell back. And the trouble is when you're native when when you're using you know um, DDR RAM, however it's disguised or wrapped up. Um, there are refresh cycles and all sorts of things going on. So you can have these periods where you get this latency, where you don't get the um, data back as soon as you expect. In addition, with the Hyper RAM, 
you're using you're not using a separate address and memory bus cats on the wrong side of the door again surprise surprise but you're trying to cram the address and the data you're muxing it down an 8-bit uh, data interface so there's a number of clock cycles between you and getting your data what is it twinkle what are you meowing at I don't know if you've seen this one. This is the other cat that we have. This is this is the uh, the the female twinkle. Do you want to go out? Is that what you want? Right, bear with me a second. I think I've got to let the cat out with them. Yeah. I'm not giving you any more food, Twinkle. You've got food today. Do you want to go out? Outside at the back, is that what you want? No? Yes, don't just stand on the threshold. I'll try. Finish the biscuits, Lock. Can you get your shoe in the background? Oh, the cat's mad. Bonkers. Crashing my stream. Vega really just high attention uh, sorry back to where we were uh, 6809 allowed devices to specify they need more time this seems like something that will be added to the soft core to allow slow devices um, well I mean Laurie can explain a bit more I post but basically what you do is you run the memory at a much higher speed so you allow for all those extra cycles effectively uh, and mesh that into whatever frequency you're running the retro at but you need consistency obviously or you need enough time to allow for the refresh to occur Anyhow, we need, it's something we need to look at. I was just wondering whether we could go the hyper, hyper RAM route, whether that was actually practical for any retros. I don't think I've seen it used in that um, scenario, and there may be a very good reason for it, i.e. that it just isn't predictable enough or not fast enough and predictable enough. But it could save an awful lot of pins. Oh, Twinkle, what? Where do you want to go now? Hmm? Oh, is it attention? Is nobody paying attention to you in there? Is that what the problem is? Because you're not hungry because you haven't finished the food. Go on. High intention mode cat. Right. Um, okay. More research required. And if anyone's seen anyone trying this, let me know. Um, not just for general purpose, but in particular for retro type applications, which have very specific needs. The ideal for retro stuff is actually SRAM, but it's just impractical. Uh, for the smaller stuff, it's fine because you can fit it in relatively small amounts of SRAM. But there's a lot of retro stuff that will not fit, fit in most retro, most SRAMs, which meant the adding external SRAM in some cases, which isn't practical. Um, it's very difficult to get hold of, or it's expensive, plus it takes a lot of pins as well. So normally, um, using something like SD RAM is normally good enough. Possibly. And the other thing we were talking about iPost, which you may have missed, is that um, on the ECP5, we're going to be using DDR2 RAM. And whether that will be um, uh, effective enough. I am also trying to use the proper pins for it on the ECP5, DQS pin sets and groups. That would enable us to use gearing. 
And if you use gearing, you get the much higher data rates. However, you still have the latencies of the memory refreshes to deal with. A bit faster, faster data and address access. Right, so that was on there. So we've got sidetracked there, didn't we? Um, what was the other thing? I don't know if I mo mentioned this before, but um, there was a new version of Litex. Um, let me give you a link to Litex. Now, Litex is um, I using Joy Digital to do most of the work on this, but it basically it's... Um, it's Python based. It's based on the old MyGen, not NMyGen, but the old MyGen or ONGen. I think some people call it to differentiate it. Um, it's basically an SOC, but it has a lot of stuff in it, including uh, different sorts of memory support. But I, I noticed that they'd done a new version just in the new year. I think it's called 2020.12. Actually, is it? It's I think it was announced on the last day of December, actually, but whatever. Um, due to my issues with uh, streaming and broadband, uh, I haven't had a chance to cover it. But um, I believe things that were new on it were generic stuff was things like SimbiFlow initial support on the RT platform, um, presumably using Project X-Ray. And stuff but lattice nexus initial support i haven't looked at that yet i know david's working on the nexus support in um next pnr i don't know if that falls under trellis or not anyhow i can't remember what it's called but i know he's got a board uh evaluation board that he's been working with and i know he's done some um commits on the nexus front so Lattice Nexus is uh, their next generation uh, FPGA architecture. They've announced two chipset, two two product families that use effectively the same core um, technology inside. I can bring it up actually. So the two ones that use this are first one they announced was the Crosslink NX and the other one was the Certus NX. Both of these families use the same internal silicon, this new silicon. I can't remember what they called it now. Nexus, sorry. It's written in my screen. So I think there's some initial support for that. Uh, it, I don't know if anyone's looked at these, by the way. They, these are very interesting. So the Crosslink um, chips have some really good features. They are not cheap chips by any means, but you can see the features here. They have quite a bit of embedded uh, memory. They've got multipliers. Uh, they've also got ADC blocks, which is interesting, as well as the GPL. But they have quite a few high-speed pins. So, for example, they've got here 10 gigabits per second. They've got MIPI type DPHY uh, hardware. So you can do MIPI directly, which is really cool. And on the higher end ones, you've got the 5 gigabit per second PCIe Gen 2 stuff. Um, fast surdies, but only in small numbers. And there's a few different packages. What is really weird is I looked at this package the other day, the 256. TABGA package here, this one, and I thought oh, that's really weird. Number of IOs, maybe that was a misprint. But if you download the spreadsheet for the pinouts, a uh, whole crap load of the pins are just NC, not connected, which is really weird. So there's a big difference between these two. So unlike something like an ECB5 that comes in the 256 ball, you know, the 45F version 
and the 12 and the 25 have pretty much share all the pins. So they're the same, but that's not the case for these. Uh, so that's quite an interesting thing that's, that we're gonna see on the platform soon. Um, you, you can see here the, 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 uh, the features. It's very low power as well, which is very interesting. Great for low power apps, but it's got some very high speed interfaces built in including i think things like um the um if you're doing gigabyte max they support those 1.25 gigabit per second the lvds type uh interfaces but the mippy thing is a really important one um and then the other version that's got this this new um, silicon in the Certus NX, similar features, but they don't have the MIPI features. They probably got the same silicon hardware, but they're probably not pinned out on the MIPI PHYs. So you see some similar features here, fast stuff. Fast differential, some with PCIe, um, but without a mention for the um, MIPI stuff on here. As I say, it's their new FDSO, SOI, low power transistors. And it's 28 nanometer. I think the other stuff is like 40 nanometer. You know, the ice stuff. Uh, up to 39,000 logic cells and up to 2.9 megabit memory as well as the uh, DSP stuff. So they're nice chips, but they are quite expensive. And um, the actual, the Crosslink ones were announced first. They're very difficult to get hold of for ages, but I think you can now get them. Uh, I don't know about the Certus ones in terms of stock. But... It's interesting stuff. So um, we're seeing some of that support come down, which is good. It'll be interesting to work with that stuff later. So what else did they talk about? So um, apparently the Litex, so this is not anything to do with the Lattice stuff. This is just generically Litex stuff. They talk about DDR4 support. Uh, PCIe, which is interesting, uh, GTH slash GTY, gigabit type stuff, SATA support as well, which is um, an interesting one. If you want uh, access to storage devices, that might be useful in some cases. And they're saying, um, I think he's talking about VEX RISC 5 SMP support as well. So those were kind of the, the big features on that new version of Litex, which is interesting. Again, I don't have much experience with the Litex stuff. Uh, Laurie probably knows more about that than, than I do. But some interesting stuff being added in. And I think Enjoy Digital are also working on this new, what is it, RPC memory, which is a small pin count memory. I don't have the details about it. Most of the packages are in, you know, wafer scale, CSP type packages, which are tiny. That reminds me, by the way, one of the things I was looking at, I was looking at um, low power ice devices. And I was toying with doing a low power ice board. Um, and there was one particular package I was interested in, but it's a nightmare to get the PCBs done because on the on the I think they're CS BGAs or is it CA CU BGAs? It's like a 0.4 pitch between the balls, which is twice. Uh, or oh, sorry, half the pitch of the 
something like an ecp5 which you know the ones we're using for the 256 ball and the 381 ball have a 0 0.8 mil pitch um so these low power ones with quite a few pins i was looking at like 121 pin lp lp chip because it had the right kind of pins but just a nightmare it, I mean, they're only slightly larger than the wafer level CSP ones, which are 0 0.35 pitch. But when you try and do the PCs, oh, I don't know if I can show you here. I'll show you what I mean. Um, if I can show you what this looks like. These damn things are tiny teeny tiny teeny tiny right well, i'm just trying to make enough room on my screen to be able to see all this let me just turn this on so you guys can see it Uh, please be out. Oh, not that one. We just choose the right view area. And get this to a size that fits on the screen bear with me one second so here you see my cursor why can't you see my cursor that's interesting there we go so this is one of the lp devices i was looking at uh, just to give you an idea that header on the top was a um 60 pin header i think 1.27 pitch so if you zoom in on this, let me just turn that dial off because that's another problem. If you wanted to escape this signal here, what you find, let me just turn the DRC on, hopefully that will show up. This is what you're going to see. Can you see that there? What the DRC is showing you? It's saying the track is too wide. There's not enough clearance between the track and the pads. Um, so when you're designing PCBs, you have to uh, bear in mind what the limits are of the PCB manufacturing. And in this case, I'm using a JLC PCB spec. So this is a 3.5 mil track. I'm showing it in, um, yeah, well, whatever. That is a 3.5 mil track, which translates to 0.09-ish uh, mil width. And then the distance between A1 and A2, these two bores on this chip, are 0 0.4 so even with a small 3.5 mil um, track you cannot get it out this is a limiting factor and in fact in order to do this you'd have to go down below 3.3 3.1 1. so if you look at people like jail pcb or pcb way you, you can't do this with a normal service. So you have to start dealing with much more expensive PCBs. I mean, they really shoot up huge amounts. Not only that, but when you want to do, so th this is only escaping the top, the outer balls. When you get to the inner balls, you need small vias as well. And the only easy way of doing that in the, with, with small enough vias is you use micro vias and blind, 
fires and stuff. And once you add all those two components in, these very thin tracks, low clearances, and the uh, blind buys, etc., suddenly your PCB cost just shoots through the roof. So that's the only trouble with these uh, a lot of these low power ones. So I was experimenting with that to see where I could get to. I mean, look, there's the that's a hyperam chip there. Look at the distance between the balls. You got miles between them when you compare it to these. I mean, it's difficult to show how small that is. You know that that chip is tiny. Distance there is what. I don't know, four mil or something. Hold on, let me see here. I wonder if I can use a dimension. Oh, can I do it from there? Let's just get it on a layer that's actually readable. Yeah, so the dimension of the chip is about five mil. So it's five mil one five mil and you've got 121 balls in there um so these are teeny tiny and this is one of the bigger ones you know if you look at the smaller ones like the wl csp ones so if you was to look i'll show you if i can add this in actually it's quite amusing so if you look at the up uh 3k type uh chip Uh, where would I find that? It's under here somewhere at least. And I'm cheating on here because I've squeezed these. Which is a trick that you can do. So if you look at the 3K version of the ICE, you know, the up 3K, look how teeny tiny this damn thing is. It is ridiculously small. And that's got, uh, what is it, 32 pins or something. But the, the it's an even smaller pitch. <laughs> it's just incredibly small. But luckily, you don't have many to break out. That's the advantage. Um, this has been designed so you can do this on a lower cost PCB. So what I've done is I've narrowed the um, uh, the outer layers. I don't know if it will work on this one. Um, I don't know if this is narrow enough. Let's just say we connect one of these pins. What do we want to connect? Um, let's say we do C2 or B2 would be nice. So let's just connect one of these up. That's what I mean. PLL. Let's do this as, hold on. Back in now. Frame out. Plus. So on here, I don't know if this will work or not. It might not be wide enough. So if I do my DRC check. Complaining about the width. Hold on, let me check my DRC settings. Size is 3.5 mil. I don't know, 3 mil. Oh, yeah. My bad.
Okay, so here what you see, it's not had a problem. So what you can do is you can kind of squeeze these out by cheating, but even that's okay for a hacky way of putting one of those on the board. When it comes to manufacturing, you get inconsistencies in manufacture because these are out of the manufacturing specification. When you've crushed your ball into a small, you know, stopped pad like that. But it's a good cheat if you want to just get one in the board. Um, if you were to manufacture any number of these in, in a factory, what you'd find is all sorts of issues. You'd find a lot of failures on the line. Uh, actually, I think um, I think Luke, when he worked on one of the one of his tiny FPGA boards, used this trick or a similar trick, and he actually did it for his production. I don't know what his yield was, but yeah. But it just shows you how teeny tiny these are. Um, hmm. Anyhow, gone off at a tangent slightly here. But I was playing around with different chips, and that's what um, that's why I wanted to just comment on that. Right. So uh, that's the Litex stuff I mentioned, um, and the other chips I was talking about using. So I haven't found anything that I can use easily um, with decent pricing. In the low power range so i'm going to put that on hold for a bit i mean i might wait and use the nexus possibly but they start at fairly high prices um they're more expensive than the ecp5s but they use a lot less power than ecp5 ecp5s are not particularly power efficient um so if you wanted to do it in a low power application then for retro and that kind of stuff, it doesn't matter. Um, although you may have to consider battery life. But there are a lot of applications where power consumption is very important and battery life is very important. And I want to be able to offer a, a lower power board. Um, and the ice 40s are pretty good, but you know, we will see. Maybe waiting for the Nexus stuff um, is a way forward, but it will make for a more expensive board. So we've covered the uh, Litex thing, uh, covered the Winbond stuff, the Hyper RAM. We need to look at that. Would what delay the ECP5 high post? The low power board. Would. Uh, well, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I wouldn't do it before the um, ECP5. I'm still working on the ECP5 stuff. In fact, I've I've got all the bits more or less for the ECP5 stuff now. So I'll have to ship um, once I'm happy with the design over to. Shenzhen and deal with the customs as well, which is a pain in the ass. But Toby helped sort a lot of that out for me. Yeah, and I've got to be careful because we've got their uh, their breaks coming up in Feb, where they close down for a week or two. So it won't be until after that, the production part of it, because I've not even tested the stuff well enough yet. But no, ECP5 is a priority. Um, let's do some stuff on the tiles. Hold on. Tile stuff. So uh, I had a bit of a nightmare over the break. I went backwards and forwards, and I've eventually circled back round. So one of the things I was looking at, what do I do first? Do I cover the chips first or the tiles first? Let's cover the chips. So if you remember, originally we were looking at, hold on. Let 
me see. We were looking at using these for motor driving purposes because they're kind of neat. But they're actually slightly overpowered for what we need. Um, let me show you quickly if I can. Is it in my recent history? Okay, so anyhow, um, I was looking back through some projects I worked on. One of the projects that I was working on several years, about four or five years ago, had a load of motors, lots and lots of motors. It was a, um, it was a um, robotic diagnostic uh kit for um life sciences applications i mean it's ironic what it was because it's the kind of thing that would be really big uh in in covid situations um but i was working on this like five years ago uh, so what it would do is it would um the uh, robotic system actually automated um, things like swab, i.e. swab or blood analysis. It would uh, it would extract and amplify the DNA, and then it would put it through um, a, a an optical process. Com combined electrical and optical process where the DNA will be extracted and replicated over a period of time and markers normally from a viral uh, template um, would be uh, characterized. Um, most of the applications in this case that I were working on were for things like uh, detecting sexually transmitted diseases, tuberculosis, and also a lot of applications for in hospitals where you, you, you're often swabbed in and out and during whilst you're there for the, you know, the kind of superbugs um, because they were a big problem at the hospitals in one time. So a lot of these were devices. So this was an automated system for that because it was a very manual process before. So you'd have multiple lanes, multiple samples, and it would take it for all of these. And then it would do an analysis to see if this virus was present, i.e. the DNA match. But in order to do that, multiple channels, it, 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 there was a lot of liquid moving between stages and there was an X and Y platform and all sorts of different things and all sorts of stepper motors, pressure sensors, etc. But we had a crap load of motors that we had to concurrently control in order to orchestrate this process as part of the machinery. Um, but some of them were very small. They were actually really tiny stepper motors, you know, no bigger than the ones that we've been using here, really. Um, but they had these kind of long screw threads on them and those were used to move the pipetting systems up and down and we had lots of different lanes of pipetting to move the uh, the organic material through the processes prior to the um, uh, PCA or the uh, DNA amplification and replication in the heated and optical chambers. So we had to find something that's very low cost. And I found these um, very small uh, chips that were great for driving. And in, in this case, the motors we were driving were actually very, very small stepper motors. <clears throat> so the ones that we found were um, Um, I've got a link somewhere here. I thought I had the uh, 
data sheet. Bear with me. We'll bring it up. Oh, what's that? So what we used was we used a, a, a whole crap load of these actually. Now these aren't particularly e efficient. Just to give you an idea, the ones we were looking at just now, the 4950s were up to three and a half amp current on each leg. Um, whereas what we're looking at here is the capability of these top out about an amp. Um, so as you can see here, max is one amp. So these are, the application here is normally for about a quarter of the kind of current um, that you'd be using on the others. And these are very, very small, so like 10, well, I say small, not small compared to what I've just been showing you with the CSPs. But they're great little motors, motor drivers for small motors you know particularly i mean they will drive something up to that kind of size i guess uh, i've got to do a current test with these see how well they would perform but they will certainly be able to drive you know the stepper motors that uh, that you're familiar with that i've been using here Hold on, let me just remind you of the smaller motors that we were thinking of using you know from the robotics point of view um, so this sort of size stepper motors, these are normally driven by like half amp. Right. Or the um, brushed motors, um, which I probably showed you before. These ones here, in fact, let me um, bring that a bit closer. You might be able to see it. these small ones. You know, these top out, these stall about 900 milliamps, these ones. So they're well within range. I mean, there's a bit of loss. The, imp the impedance or resistance on these motor drivers here are about one ohm. So you've got a bit of loss. But for modest type applications, they're very good. As I say, I've used them before. So I was going to get hold of some of these and maybe do a, a tile with these. But one of the things that struck me, let me show you the diagram here. So one of these chips is capable of driving either a stepper motor or two of these kind of small brush motors. And then you have four inputs controlling them. So they're kind of twice efficient, as efficient as the others. But without the current limiting but that's less of an issue because these are very small current devices and they don't get too warm etc there's no runaway with them and of course when i thought about that i suddenly realized um size wise uh these are tiny so when I started looking at all the different type of boards that I want to put on the um, tile, I realized that these were all going to be, a lot of the stuff going on these boards was so small that they were going to be dwarfed. So I decided to relook at the tiles. So if I go back to the CAD now, and just show you what I mean here. Um, Just bring this up. Uh, that, let's open something else. So, how do I say that? So, I was looking at this. So, I circled back round. Hold on. So, I circled back round. The tiles I was thinking of originally, just before Christmas, were of a dimension of something like 75 mil by 
36 mil, I think they were. That meant that you could get two on the top, two on the bottom. And then each one had 12 IOs. But when it came to fitting these on, they'd just get dwarfed on something like this, as would some of the other things. So I considered again of going back to an original tile design um, and this one that you can see here is uh, based around a smaller tile. So here we have a board that's 100 by 100 that can, is capable of fitting four tiles. In fact, what I'm probably going to go with, what I want to do today is actually change the dimensions of this. So let me just open that, see if I can do that now. So you can see what this would look like. In fact, let me come back around to that. So the point point being here is I could fit four tiles on the top, four tiles on the bottom, and then I have half as many IOs, dedicated GP IOs from the FPGA on each board. Reason being, it's a better size to fit things in. But if you needed a bigger one, you could easily double up. So either use two boards or make a bigger board that fits across both. Um, I'm going to change these IOs. So one of the things I want to work on is changing this, this template today to what we need it to be. But the thinking is here. So each one of these tiles would have possibly eight GPIOs, plus they'd have SPI pins, plus they'd have two ADC pins. That's the thinking. Um, and then when we place something on here, so I can actually place, you can see how big those chips are. Let me just get rid of these things. because These are in the way. I can put you off. Put those to one side. Uh, add, oh, what's it called? LV? I wonder if I've got these in my current library, actually. Those are the old ones. Sorry, I'm just bumping between two files here. I thought I actually had this. Hold on. I'm just trying to work out where I actually got it in the library here. I think it's LV star. Yeah, there we go, cool. What's the difference? Oh, yeah. So that would mean on each one of these newer tiles, I'd have two of these. And you can see the amount of room they take up, even on these larger tiles. They're fairly teeny tiny. I took up very little room. And then you'd need two headers. Um, which could either be uh, you think they can either be 
have a look at the con molex ones for the moment. So if it was if they were Hmm. So we use these. I just want to show the dimensionality here and the kind of sizes that we're talking about. So there's no problem fitting these on here. In fact, there's loads of room, which is good because you probably want some uh, reservoir caps and decoupling caps, and maybe some feedback for positional controls as well on the same board. And the good thing about these is not only will they drive, so this board, a single tile like this, could drive four DC brushed motors, like the small ones like this. Uh, does that give it a focus? That would be good, wouldn't it? Um, or you could drive one of those normal stepper motors. Now, the advantage of having the stepper motor drivers, even though we're less likely to use them, is they're good for learning and teaching. And it's good to be able to drive that. So the board could actually double up and drive those as well. The other interesting thing is it will drive them bidirectionally. To date, when we've been doing the um, examples for uh basic driving of stepper motors we've used a unipolar driving technique where you have a common high voltage and then you drag the either end of the coils low with bipolar you drive both ends of the coil concurrently high and low um, that means you actually get with bipolar driving stepper drivers you get twice the torque that you'd normally get in the unipolar i said it's approximately twice the torque. you get more torque so it's actually better for driving them as well. Because one of the problems you have with uh, turning those uh, motors, because of the gearing, um, you can't drive them very fast. So with something like this, you'd be able to drive them a bit faster because you'd have the bipolar driving rather than just the unipolar driving. But I mean, I, I will cover that um, in one of the sessions that we do. So these look pretty cool and I can get these. So one minute, what size are those tiles? So these tiles are slightly smaller. I'm gonna go and edit these in a minute so you can see. But effectively you're, you're looking at something that is approximately, well it's less than 50 millimeters by 50 millimeters. Um, so on the ECP version of the you know the black stack if you like you will have eight of these four on the top and then four on the bottom so you could actually do eight different tiles uh, one of the other things i'm looking at one of the reasons i was looking at the low power stuff was doing uh, a single sided um, black stack as well um for when we run out of black ice which we will do um we're getting closer to that all the time so a kind of what i wanted because i want the ecp5 stuff 
and that's great and that will drive eight tiles but there's going to be some applications where you wouldn't need eight tiles or necessarily the power of the ecp5 um, which was why i was looking at the low powered ice 440s for that but um, I've got a couple of possibilities with that. One of which is to maybe do an up 5K version uh, that just supports tiles on the top, up to four tiles on the top. And that's possible using the up 5K. The biggest problem with the up 5K is you can't add any external memory because there's just not enough pins. But that may not be a problem for some applications. Um, and I'm still toying with that idea. That would be like porting alloy or something similar into this format. Yeah, pins. Um, luckily, most FPGAs do have a lot of pins. It's just finding a reasonable one. I mean, I did actually toy with looking at the, uh, you know, using the HX8 again. But... <laughs> You know the kind of money you're paying almost as much for the hx series as you are for the ecb5 now that's not the only cost um unfortunately when you're designing an ecp5 board you have to go with a quite expensive pcb setup because it needs to be six layers um, and the reason it has to be six layers is because you've got 256 ball grid array uh, and the only way to break those balls out is using vias and layers and dog legs. So um, it does make the PCBs more expensive. So that's quite an important one, really. So I'm still considering what could I use? I mean, the UP 5K is fairly low power. That might be good enough. And it's an interesting chip, plus it's got a small amount of SRAM in it's got the DSP units, which is kind of cool. Um, there is still a possibility, but I think to get a decent price, I would have to buy a lot, a frightening number because they come on reels of uh, let me think, they come on reels of 2000 and they're five dollars a piece. A rid of that is going to set you back ten thousand dollars, but you can get that discounted. But even so, a lot of cash, so you'd have to settle a lot of boards to make that viable. Um, quick logic. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a couple of questions here. Um, I post human. What about Quick Logic? I have looked at Quick Logic. I love what they're doing, combining the ARM and the um, FPGA. But the FPGA that they combine is very limited. There's not many um, resources in it. Uh, there's also a very expensive way of doing it. They're not cheap. I think they're about fifteen dollars. It's difficult to get them because they don't have distribution either. I think you have to contact them directly. They briefly have a spell of being available on mails, but I don't think they're stocked any longer. Um, mythical, um, mythical suggesting hi. Couldn't you make a super small six-layer PCB purely to break out the pins, make it more manageable size? Um, the answer to that mythical is yes that, and that's exactly what i'm thinking of doing so the reason i've got these signals here is this could be the connector for the ecp5 system on a module which i am currently favoring um, because th that board would be something like 40 by 40 by 65 mil but that's significantly smaller than this board 
So the only bit that would need to be six layer, as you are suggesting, is the bit with the ECP5 and et cetera on. Um, I can show you something similar to that if we look at an early uh, am amalgam. Something like this. This one had an 80 pin, uh, 1.27 mil dual roll pitch. We need to be a bit wider than that. So that's about 52, 53 mil wide. We need to go probably to 65 mil wide. And then this connector would be 100 pins, i.e. two rows of 50. Um, rather than two rows of 40, as you can see here. The reason we need more pins, uh, potentially, oh, well, hmm. just counting them up in my head. For the amalgam version of the tile board, i.e. the black stack, we'd need 64 IOs just to do the tiles. And then you need 16 analog so we're already up to 80 pins and that's not enough because the other pins you need on here you need SPI you probably need a TXRX you need I squared C slash can if you if you're using can as well exposing that um, you also need power 5 volt 3 volt 3 and ground zero volts and what was the other thing um you might need usb as well i need to circle back round for that but. so that's why you need to go up to the 100 pin header rather than the 80 pin header but it, otherwise it would be quite similar to this so if you can imagine the ecp5 here and instead of having the, this is a um, ESP32 S3, so you wouldn't have that. You'd have the um, STM32 F7 or H7 in a 100 LQFP package. So um, it will be very much like this, but it'd be wider. And that is the way I'm favoring doing it at the moment. That means you only need that much at six layers. The uh, tile board here would only need to be four layers. Basically. Uh, I posted, uh, I thought that was the one you were going with. It, it is, but it's, as I say, it's 100 pins rather than 80 pins. On the 80 pin version that we had for that amalgam design, the we only needed 48 IOs. But by changing these tiles to an 8 pin per tile, the requirements go up from 48 to 64 to do eight tiles, i.e. four on the top, four on the bottom. For the uh, low power one, we're only needing four on the top. So we actually only need um, half that amount, 32 and eight analog, which are much more modest, of course. Um, so, let's just Oh, did I say that? Yeah. Let me change this because the other thing that's going to change with this, uh, let me, where's it gone? Let me show you the part for this. PCB layout. Uh, come on. Oh, 
uh, let it maybe. So this is the part. Uh, one of the other things that would change here is we would have so that hold on, that wouldn't be there. We'd have v plus there, v minus here on the center. This would need to be wider. Uh, oh. Move into millimeters. Let's get this right. So it'd look more like that. Uh, these are actually slightly shrunken as well. I'd probably expand these. No, 24. Oh, okay. Making some fine adjustments here. Something like that. Basically, let's just save that. Let's reload this to Reload. So on here, Okay, so it's more like the size that we're talking about now. Those are 50 by 50, but I just need to change the placement slightly. Hold on. Let's give you a better idea of where these are. So that needs to, where does that need to sit? 20, 25, I think. Ah, okay. Hold on. Sorry. Made a slight mistake here. I'm just going to put that down there for a moment. We don't actually need that. Okay. 
it's just it was going off the edge of the design because I had that stray hole it's counted as part of the design five okay same again oh twinkly you back again what's the problem are you not getting any attention in there hmm are you not getting any attention or what? Hey? They've been miserable. Meow, meow, meow. Let me just trim this up a bit. Seven, two, five. Why not, Twinks? Okay. What do you want? You want to come out? I'm not going to give you any food. Come on. Here's Clay. Don't play with the foxes though. Sorry for that intrusion. Say cats, who'd have them? Right. Uh, so this is what it would look like approximately. Ignore this kind of ground hole here. That's not that's gonna go away. I haven't taken it away because if I delete that now, it will complain bitterly because the symbol is still connected to that. So this will go something like there, and that there'll be a board around this. So I'd have to just let me just show you roughly what that would look like. Be like a that kind of thing, I guess. kind of imagine a board around it something like that so that's where the ECP five parts would be and that will be pointing down actually this I should probably turn out the other way that. that's on the underside of that board If that makes any sense whatsoever. Are you back again? I just kicked you out. Oh, you're all wet. Is it raining? That's why you're back in. Uh, and the overall dimensions of this, by the way, are 100 by 100 mil, which is a reasonable size. That's like, um, do I have something 100 by 100? Hmm. Uh, well, if you look at the um, MX board, that's 60. That'd be bigger than that, I guess, wider. Um, you don't have anything that side. Oh, it's a sandwich. Yeah, it's more like 100. Hundred wide. So it'd be a hundred square. Roughly speaking. So that's the changes I'm going to make. So I just wanted to cover those briefly. I think we're just about to run out of time, actually. We've been streaming now for about two hours, 20. Um, so the tile boards will be slightly larger. Remember before, the dimensions of the entire board was 75 by 75. We've gone up to 100 by 100 millimeters, that is. Each tile is then 
50 by 50 millimeters or thereabouts. Uh, each has eight GPIOs plus by and two analog. So that much hasn't changed. Oh, I should move these now because that looks daft. They're not on the edge. There yeah, or thereabouts, something like that. And then we'd have the system on a module, ECP5 system on a module. Um, and this would almost be like a new version of the black edge standard but instead of having two connectors like uh, this the current black edge which has two that's two lots of 50 we'd have one lot of 100 on the base and then that format could support so on that board, you've got a choice of either the ESP 512F combined with an F7, which is a 100 pin LQFP, uh, which is a 216 megahertz uh, F7 arm with the ART accelerator uh, and cache. Um, or it would have the 45F, 256 ball ECP5, probably combined with the 400 uh, megahertz uh, H7. Again, in a TQF 100. So those would be, so there'd be two SOM choices that you can make. So, when this will be available, you could order it in one or t'other format. Uh, you might not want as much, you know, as many lookup tables. The 12F is going to be considerably cheaper than the 45F. The price difference between those two chips is quite large. Um, and the price between the two different STM32s between the F7 and the H7 is there's quite a bit of price difference between those two as well. But they're designed to be quite balanced in terms of performance. So one's a really high performance, but it also takes more current, uh, and the other's a slightly lower performance, but takes less current. Um, and because of the memory on the um, ECP5, which is DDR2, the I will probably put 32 megabytes on the 12F and 64 megabytes on the 45F. That's the plan. Um, and I've already got the components for all of this, so that shouldn't be up. Twinkle, you're giving me such a hard time, Cat. Look, come on. She's intense tonight. So where was I? Yes, yeah, so your 12F version, so it's 12F with an F7 running at 216 megahertz and also connected to the ESP5 will be 32 megabytes of DDR2. Then for the 45F ECP5, it would have 64 megabytes of DDR2 and it would have a 400 megahertz STM32 H7 on the board so there's two different versions of that but the door the, the carrier if you like uh the black stack board uh will be the same for both be identical so you can swap between the two if you need to basically and that would house actually twice the number of tiles so what is it going to 
duplicate that you'll see exactly i'll just show you quickly before we uh, adjourn for the evening just duplicate these just so you get the full picture uh, That will result in this kind of effect. Oh, it's a bit off. It's going to be great fun routing all of this stuff. But I should be able to do it on the four layer board fairly well. Thus, so there you've got eight boards. You've got four on the top, four on the bottom. Uh, any questions before I disappear? Oh, I haven't had anything to eat this evening, so I'm really hungry. I've got to go shortly. But please, if you've got anything, just fire it away quickly. No, okay. Well, listen, uh, please do join us down on the forum if you've got any questions you need to shoot off. I'm going to carry on with some more of this um, uh, next week. Uh, I've got quite a bit of routing to finish on the ECP5 right now, which I've got to work on this week. Uh, also, I want to return to doing some of the m margin stuff. Uh, and by the way, yeah, I do hope to be able to run the Python stuff, um, not just MMIGEN, but on the STM32 as well. Although that will require some porting and some cleverness for the memories, which I'm still trying to work out. Um, so you could program them, the STM32 either in C or possibly in MicroPython, or maybe even CircuitPython, but that's, I'm not sure which yet. So anyhow, I'm going to leave it there for tonight. I think I've coloured our bases. And I look forward to, now that my broadband's working again and I can stream again, I look forward to uh, catching up with you guys uh, next week. So thanks for joining me and uh, I'll speak soon. Ciao.